paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. It's a perfect morning on the African felt. A matriarch is leading a herd of savannah elephants to one of their favorite watering holes. It happens daily in many parts of Africa. But these elephants are unique. So is their home. Less than a century ago, their ancestors were condemned to death by government decree. Then they were hunted almost to extinction. <laughs> Yet from that merciless massacre has dawned a new era for a tiny terrorized band of elephants. And with it the heartwarming tale of one of the greatest feats of elephant conservation. This is Avril from Addo. She's 55 years old and a great grandmother. She's also the oldest survivor of a herd of elephants isolated for over a century in the equivalent of a lost world. Avril and Addo's other elephants, over 350 of them today, thrive here in the Addo Elephant National Park in South Africa's Eastern Cape Province. Okay, and then the elephants, you find them now at a uh, Domgrach Dam. They are signed, Domgrach. You must go there. The big water hole. Find plenty of elephants there. They're at the top of a chain of life that makes this one of the most diverse biospheres in Africa. <laughs> By African standards, the park is still relatively small, so visitors enjoy often very close encounters with probably the most people-friendly wild elephants in Africa. Elephants whose ancestors feared and hated humans. Like so many crusades, the battle to save Addo's elephants was born from the determination and courage of a few conservation pioneers, like former big game hunter Harold Trollope, farmer Jack Harvey, and Graham Armstrong, inventor of the world's wild elephant proof fence. They promoted conservation at a time when killing wildlife was fashionable. Now people around the world share their dream. It's a dream born from the nightmare of the past. The 
Cape of Good Hope, 1652. When the Dutch established a settlement, they found hundreds of elephants roaming at the foot of Table Mountain. Settlement commander Jan von Riebeck traded a handful of tobacco for three elephant tusks from local tribesmen. The dawn of a new ivory trade. European settlers used ever more powerful guns to mow down the herds. The Industrial Revolution and its wealthy new middle class fed the demand for ivory products. Merchants flocked to markets like this one near Addo to buy ivory for export. America, Britain and Europe imported tons of tusks every year. The ivory was used to make everything from piano keys and billiard balls to chess sets, knife handles, jewellery and trinkets. To escape the guns, some of the shrinking elephant herds found refuge in a thorny citadel called the Addo Bush. British zoologist Dr. Anna Whitehouse yeah. is an expert on Addo's yeah. elephants. Well, in southern Africa, elephants were more or less wiped out by 1900. In, in South Africa itself, in 1900, there were four tiny populations of elephants. The largest was, in fact, in Addo, and there were only 140 elephants in Addo. Addo's elephants, shown in this rare archival footage, were scarred from regular encounters with hunters. Many had infected bullet wounds that made them extremely aggressive. All hated humans. But humans kept invading their territory. When farmers planted oranges in the Addo district before the First World War, hungry elephants came out of the arid bush to raid them at night. Farmers shot the marauders on sight. It was war. Elephants were gunned down and people were gored or trampled to death. Angry farmers demanded action. 1918. The government approached decorated war hero and big game hunter Major Jan Pretorius with a brutal request. Exterminate the Addo elephants. Pretorius knew it was a tough assignment, so he drove a hard financial bargain before unpacking his lethal .375 Jeffrey's double-barreled rifle. Addo historian so Colin Urquhart. And they said to him he could have a portion of the ivory and he could have some of the, the small elephants to ship to zoos and he could have some of the skins and sell it to museum skeletons. So then Pretorius really got going. Pretorius hunted in style, as shown in these photographs taken for the book he later wrote. He set up camp in the Addo bush with his wife, on the right in this picture, and even a secretary to handle his fan mail. Visitors flocked to Addo to pose proudly for photographs on the bodies of his many victims. Despite the searing summer heat, at times Pretorius wore this full leather outfit so he could hunt deep within the dense bush. Bush with thorns that could rip flesh like a sharp knife. He called it a hunter's hell. Pretorius killed quickly, efficiently, and on a massive scale. Among his guides was local farmer Jack Harvey, who was soon sickened by the slaughter and set out to save at least a few elephants. Although assisting Pretorius, Harvey secretly worked against the hunter. Harvey's granddaughter, Felicity Hoffmeyer, proudly remembers the crucial role her grandfather played. My grandfather actually hid away 17 elephants to try and sort of protect some of them.
He just pushed them into the densest part and never took Pretorius to that, that specific area where he had them. All the soil is reddish down that way too. And the elephants take on that sort of color as camouflage from the red soil. And with the, the grayness of the bush and it being so dense, uh, Pretorius would never ever have found an elephant. News of the slaughter provoked protests from as far away as Britain and the United States. But Pretorius massacred 120 elephants before the government finally ordered him to stop. By now, even he agreed that some of the elephants should be spared to prevent extinction. The Addo Elephant National Park was finally proclaimed in 1931 to offer sanctuary to the 12 terrified survivors. Park warden Harold Trollope's first job was to find them in the dense bush on Jack Harvey's farm, then drive them over 40 kilometers to their new home. After years spent hunting lions and other big game all over Africa, this would prove to be one of Trollope's most perilous exploits. His son, Glenn, recalls. And they've been shot at and trap guns set and all manner of things like that. And uh, they were as savage as anything and unrelenting <laughs> hatred against uh, mankind. He'd have to locate the elephants first, check on which way the wind was blowing, and then he had his gang on certain signals, they would fire shots. Hessian soaked in tar, tied on the end of a stick, and they'd, they'd light that and it would smoke. And you know, then he could see where they were, and the elephants didn't like the smell of the smoke, and they'd move away from it. And that way, they would move them. As they reached the new park, a large bull charged one of Trollope's terrified beaters. We were nine feet from Dad when he shot him. The impetus of the fall carried his body forward, although his feet were not working anymore. And he was lying there with his tusk buried in the ground. To keep the elephants in the park, Trollope's beaters frightened them back with shots from trap guns, even blasts from this small cannon. Trollope also experimented with electric fencing, but the cunning beasts continued to escape. Elephant expert Dr. Ian White explains why. They've learned ways of, uh, of getting through electric fencing. One of the ones is uh, they learned to push a tree over onto the fence, which breaks the fencing. Once the, the tree's broken the fence, they know that they can go through. They seem to be able to detect the, the electrical impulses in these fences. A the second way they do it is to just use the tip of the tusk. If the, if the tusk is long enough, then, uh, then the electricity doesn't travel up the tusk. And they just catch it with the tip of the tusk and just lift it until it breaks. And then the, a third way that they've learned is to get a young bull and push him through the fence and let him take the, the whack of the electricity. <laughs> and uh, then they follow him through. To stop the elephants raiding their orchards, nearby farmers started bringing oranges to the park to feed them. But still, the elephants left the park at night, damaging orchards and farm dams, smashing windmills and fences. Several laborers on their way home, perhaps, um, would be killed. You know, an elephant takes you in his trunk and he slashes you down like that and it's just one shot and you're gone. One bull, ironically named Pretorius, killed park ranger Samuels outside the park and had to be shot. His tusks made a fine trophy. This young bull named H.T. charged a train and was killed. Two weeks later, Malsera, a cow, died the same way. 
Conservationists clamoured for the construction of a wild elephant-proof fence, the first in the world, to keep Addo's elephants inside the park. New park ranger Graham Armstrong soon came up with a brilliant idea. In 1952, he persuaded the government to let him build a fence from old tram lines and many kilometres of discarded steel lift cables from the Johannesburg gold mines. It was a huge task, mostly done by hand, as shown in this rare film, recently discovered in the South African National Park's archives. First, a boundary path was cleared around the park. Over 4,000 holes were dug, which were sunk four metres apart, deep into the ground, to form the main fence posts. The lift cables were strung between them, then pulled tight using a winch and a pickup truck. Wooden droppers were fashioned by hand, their points sharpened to stop elephants damaging them. These were fixed to the cables in between the steel posts. Armstrong built a tunnel under the fence so he and his staff could enter safely. By now, the herd had grown to 22 elephants. Hapur, this huge bull whose name means notched ear in Afrikaans, was the dominant male. Armstrong's friend, Jack Skeed, recalls the day the park was finally enclosed. He saw old bull Hapur come up to the fence and put his head against it and push and push and push. And he was a very, very big elephant. And he made no impression on it. And Armstrong uh, said to himself, well, thank heavens for that. Hopper turned round as if to walk away. He then backed up to the fence and put his backside against it and pushed and pushed and pushed and still couldn't make any impression. So he just walked away and uh, gave up the, the, the effort. Other elephants tested the fence but failed to break it. The Addo Park and its elephants were secure for the first time. So successful was the design that much of the original fence remains in use today, a monument to the ingenuity of Graham Armstrong and his team. And they continued feeding them and it soon became a tourist spectacle and people could come every day at five o'clock or something and watch the elephants eating oranges. And tourists didn't go into the elephant area back in those days. The elephants in those days were very, very dangerous. They were not habituated at all. They were not gentle elephants. They were very, very vicious elephants. Um, so tourists didn't go into the park, so the only way they could see them was at feeding time. So feeding continued. But eventually the parks board realised that this was more of a circus atmosphere than a natural population. Um, and so they decided to stop feeding the elephants, and they stopped in 1978. <laughs> Coinciding with that, they started taking tourists into the park, initially in, um, in guided vehicles and eventually in 1982 in self-driven vehicles. As the elephants grew used to tourists in cars, they gradually lost their fear of humans. Addo soon became an ecotourism success story based on mutual respect between animals and humans. This peaceful relationship still continues, despite a huge increase in tourist numbers, says Addo Park manager Fundesele Nkatene. They are also friendly elephants. They're not aggressive. We never had any problems. Um, between the, the, the tourist cars and elephants like in other areas. Isolated and protected, Addo's elephant population soars, and this in turn creates a new threat to their long-term survival. The Addo elephants are very inbred, and they've lost a lot of genetic diversity, and that can be very dangerous for a population. It can threaten the long-term adaptability and viability of the population. To determine the extent of the inbreeding, Anna Whitehouse spent seven years researching the family history of every living Addo elephant. 
we've we've at the moment got over 350 elephants in the park but we started from 11 elephants and i wanted to work out how those 11 elephants got to the 350 that we've got now and i was able to retrace the population's history by looking at photographic records that had been kept by the parks board and by old park wardens and so on Elephants have a pattern of wrinkles on their face and a pattern of veins in their ears. And those are like a human fingerprint, they don't change through the animal's life. So a photograph of a calf, if you've got clear view of the wrinkles and the veins, you can match up that photograph of a calf with a living adult now. Bashing through the bush, elephant ears are often ripped and punctured. These scars are unique to a particular elephant making it easier to track through time. At the age of 50, Chaikis, or Little Holes, is one of Addo's oldest bulls. And this is what his ears looked like 25 years earlier. By comparing more than 8,000 photographs like these with today's Addo's elephants, Anna Whitehouse finally completed their family tree. She discovered that inbreeding is changing their genetic makeup, threatening the herd's future. One major genetic change is already obvious. Most of the elephants in Addo are tuskless, the females in Addo are tuskless, which is very unusual because African elephants generally have tusks. Many Addo bulls, too, have smaller tusks than is usual among African elephants. Scientists argue about the causes. Ian White blames hunting. I think that in places where, uh, like Addo, where there's a marked degree of tusklessness, that gene has, I think, been removed from the population through selective hunting. Um, people, you know, ivory hunters are not interested in, in elephants with small ivory, so that's the, the ones that have been carrying the bigger ivory that have been removed. Anna Whitehouse disagrees. She blames isolation and inbreeding. And there's been a lot of people that have thought that the tusklessness in Addo is due to hunting. And that doesn't make sense if you look at the history of Addo, because back when the park was created in 1931, half of the females had tusks. Now 98% of females have no tusks. So we've dramatically lost tusks in the past 70 years, and yet there's been no hunting. The population has been protected. So there's no way that that can be due to hunting. And it's basically due to genetic drift, which is uh, a genetic phenomenon that takes place when you have a very small population size that goes through inbreeding and so on. Alerted by these findings, a dramatic plan was devised to ensure the genetic future of Addo's herd and bring back tusks in future generations of elephant cows. Tusks, essentially outsized in size of teeth, have always been characteristic of elephants and their many prehistoric relatives. Anuncus, which lived in Europe and Asia some 10 million years ago, had tusks nearly as long as its body. Great numbers of woolly mammoths inhabited the cold tundra of Eurasia and North America. Their great curved tusks made effective snow plows, enabling them to uncover precious food during the long winters. After the last mammoth died some 4,000 years ago, African and Asian elephants became the biggest tuskers. And these are the heaviest elephant tusks on record. Weighing more than 200 kilograms, they belong to a bull shot on Mount Kilimanjaro in 1899. Addo ranger tusks. Simon Allen. Elephants' tusks are the, um, the elephant's tool, if you like. They use them a lot for digging, for feeding debarking trees, for defense as well. And often you'll find that in digging, for instance, and especially in this area for roots during the dry season, you'll get tusks being damaged, snapping off. Elephant tusks have hollow centers, particularly near the top, so they can snap quite easily. Addo's elephants are savanna elephants, like their close relatives in South Africa's sprawling Kruger National Park. 
relatives who may hold the genetic key to their survival. Here at the Kruger Park's Goldfields Environment Education Center, some of Africa's biggest elephant tusks are on display. Nicknamed the Magnificent Seven, all once belonged to Kruger bulls. They show just how puny are the tusks of many of today's Addo elephants. Elephant bulls grow throughout life uh, in body size and also it shows in the tusks. So the tusk circumference keeps growing, it's getting wider and wider and wider, right up into old age. Even relatively small tusks can be lethal weapons. Two mature elephant bulls weigh as much as a double-decker London bus. When they charge and clash, the impact can be deadly, as happened here. The victor has stabbed with such force that his tusk has smashed through his opponent's skull and penetrated the brain, killing him instantly. An elephant's skull must be large enough to house its huge brain four times the size of a human brain and anchor the tusks. If made from solid bone, it would be too heavy to move. Instead, the skull consists of sponge-like bone filled with thousands of air cavities, making it light but vulnerable. The Addo herd is helping researchers uncover some of the fascinating ways in which elephant societies evolve and function. Addo's elephants, like elephants everywhere, have an extremely complex social system. Every family member takes part in raising and protecting the young. are born after a gestation period of 22 months, more than twice that of a human baby. The developing fetus soon looks like a miniature elephant, including a trunk and large ears. This youngster will suckle until he turns four, when he'll probably have to make way for a new brother or sister. He suckles using his mouth, not his trunk. Controlling that unique appendage called a trunk is one of the most difficult skills calves have to master, as these little guys are finding out. The trunk, a combination of the elephant's nose and upper lip, has an astonishing 60,000 muscle units. Just an amazing organ. It's got uh, a sense of smell so that they can, although the head and the brain are pretty high up in the head, they are feeling down the bottom. They don't have to go by feel or smelling what they're picking up. So it's a hand and a nose and a, and a tool all in one. This is Keyhole, 37 years old and a mother of five. Her trunk helps her gather around 200 kilograms of vegetation a day. Today, she's picking out the greenest, most succulent feed from deep inside a thorn bush. Elephants have small eyes and poor eyesight. But their long trunks, more sensitive than a dog's nose, let them smell water, as well as friends and enemies, from many kilometers away. Adult elephants drink around 200 liters of water a day. 
and if they're really thirsty, they often don't bother to swallow. Like beer drinkers downing a yard of ale by relaxing their throat muscles, they can squirt the water straight into their bellies. Trunks also play an important role in mating. This hopeful bull is sniffing a very young cow to check whether she's in heat. Unfortunately for him, she's not, so he lets her walk away. The trunk is also a friendly head squeezer, a dust dispenser, an ear scratcher, a snorkel, it even makes a useful toothbrush. Like human children, Addo's elephant calves learn much through play. From an early age, it's easy to tell an elephant calf's gender simply by looking at their games. Young bulls tussle and squabble endlessly under the watchful eyes of their elders. They're sorting out their status within the family. Because knowing your place is very important in elephant society. And it's important to demonstrate that knowledge when a bull higher up the hierarchy approaches. It's a moment when turning your back is the best way to avoid trouble. But body language can be downright confusing because you can also use your backside to tell another elephant to back off. When an addo bull leaves his family at puberty, he usually roams alone. Sometimes bulls briefly join matriarchal families. or, like this pair, establish small bachelor groups. Elephants will chase anything, and it's normally the young bulls. They're like young teenage guys, they're full of nonsense. Um, young bulls will try and dominate ostriches or any other animal trying to use the water hole, even down to chasing the terrapins back into the water. They really do have a good sense of fun. Throughout their life, Bulls struggle to elevate their status within the male dominance hierarchy. They do so for one reason, sex. Must is a state of sexual excitement unique to elephants. Mature bulls experience it once a year. It's easy to spot a must bull. A streak of pungent black fluid runs down the side of his face. And, like Heike's here, he constantly dribbles urine. The, the, the most dominant bull in the population tends to have his must period over the time when most of the females will be in estrus. So he, he, will, he will then compete successfully for most of the matings. The most junior bulls, uh, a bull elephant only starts coming into must for the first time at about 25 years old. So anybody under 25 is usually not part of the, of the, the competition for the females. But uh, these bulls at the bottom of the hierarchy that come into must usually have their must period when nobody's in his chest. So, so uh, the bigger bulls are not bothered by that fact. You know, they, they, uh, you know, they just avoid this youngster who's all charged up. While young Addo bulls are squabbling, their sisters behave like little aunties, eagerly helping to care for the babies. So they know just what to do when they have their first calf, which in Addo is around the age of 13. This young cow will continue calving until she's in her 50s, ending up with a family of eight or more. 
young females never leave their mothers. Uh, so even once they're adult themselves and they start producing their own offspring, they still stay with their mother. So you have this whole mat matriarchal group with the old grandmother at the top and all of her offspring and her respective offspring with him. So it's this sort of pyramidal shape in the family, which are, and the bonds are very, very close. And when the old mother dies, uh, then the sisters often uh, split up and form their own matriarchal groups, but they maintain very close bonds with each other. And they get together and form you know, much bigger concentrations of elephants sometimes. They know each other, they're very excited to see each other. Elephants show their excitement with flapping ears, erect tails, and streams of urine. Today's Addo elephants are organized into six matriarchal families, but some are now splitting up to form smaller groups. A waterhole is their equivalent of a clubhouse, with lots of good company and plenty to drink. Waterholes also mean mud, which protects elephants against biting and parasitic insects. Like humans, elephants are largely hairless. Like us, they can suffer sunburn. But while we spend a fortune on sunscreens, they use dried mud and dust to shield their skins. And if there's no mud, you make it. Elephants don't have sweat glands, so this is one way they survive at those long, hot summers. Away from water, elephants cool down using their ears, the largest ears ever known. Elephants' ears work like a radiator in a motor car. They're packed with blood vessels and a very thin skin. When hot blood from inside the body is pumped through the ears, it quickly cools down. And the faster you flap, the cooler you get. Addo's elephants are among the fattest in Africa because of the abundance of food in the park. They thrive on bacon trees like these, named for their juicy leaves, and other succulent plants that make up what is known as valley bushveld vegetation. Ranger John Adendorf calls it an elephant's gastronomic delight. There's such a the diversity in just one small little area, and that's what's so unique about valley bushveld. Everything here is, 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 is utilized. There's nothing that's not utilized. Yeah, you've got a small crassula um, perforata. Um, you've got, like I said, the mother-in-law's tongue, the bull bean, which they love. There's no other vegetation type that can carry as much elephant as what ours can carry. Elephants have right of way here on Addo's dusty roads, and so they should. It's their home, and they've been here since before roads and cars. But there's another creature that also has priority. An even rarer inhabitant of the park. Flightless dung beetles are native to this part of South Africa, and they are very fussy eaters. They dine out and breed only on elephant, rhino, and Cape buffalo dung. So their survival depends on these far larger creatures. The reason this little guy's become flightless as opposed to the other 800 species worldwide 
is because the carrying capacity of large mammals in this bush is so high, he hasn't had to fly. Why waste energy if you don't? So he walks to work. Now, dung beetles are well known for the fact that they eat dung. Um, they basically help the uh, environment out here by burying the dung. Elephants feed between 100 and 250 kilograms of food a day. Their digestive system being a simple uh, hindgut fermenting system is not that um, good. Only digesting about 20% of what they feed on. So they're producing a fair tonnage of dung a year. And without the dung beetles, obviously it would be wall-to-wall -wall elephant dung out there. Addo's elephant population is doubling every 13 years. That's thought to be faster than any other group of elephants in Africa. So their home is becoming very overcrowded. But rather than shoot them, as in the bad old days of Major Pretorius, the park is now being expanded to more than four times its present size. Currently we are 125,000 hectares in size. Um, we hope to be able to reach just under 500,000 hectares in the next five to ten years. The new park will stretch from the rugged Zurberg Mountains in the west to the Indian Ocean in the east. Saving Addo has become an international project. Farms are being bought up and incorporated into the expanded park using donations from international conservation groups. But park manager Fundusele Mkutene admits expansion is not a long-term solution. Um, at this stage, we are controlling the population by expanding, but one day we have to stop somewhere. We are also trying to devise other means. We are busy now investigating contraception. Um, we are still concerned about it because it's, it's affecting the animal behavior, but we would like to use contraception as a means of controlling the numbers because we want to avoid culling as far as possible. The expanded park will eventually house around a thousand elephants. Will that be enough to counter the current threat posed by genetic drift? No one is certain. The more the better, basically, and a thousand is much, much better than, than 300, which is what we've got at the moment, and 300 is much better than 11, which is what we started with. As it expands, Addo will become one of the most diverse national parks in Africa. This fierce Cape buffalo is only one of more than 60 different mammal species already living in the Addo Park. They include rhino, many kinds of antelope, and these endearing meerkats. as inquisitive as any domestic cat, popping up all over the felt. Now the wildlife population is set to increase dramatically as the park expands. What they're actually doing is looking at the old hunting journals, the Bushman paintings and tribal stories of what animals did occur in the area and they're hoping to reintroduce them back. So the Addo in fact will turn a full circle from a wilderness area through its farming areas and back into a wilderness area. Restoring Addo to its former glory is a complex task because it involves recreating the original ecosystem of predators and prey. Lions, fast becoming extinct all over Africa, are among the predators to find a sanctuary in Addo. But they need prey. The water was clearly brought in for the predators in, in, in the long term. And we've now reached a, a stage where our water population is fairly high. And that will be the buffer species, so the 
uh, predators won't take out your more uh, valuable species um, like eland and, and kudu and things like that. This virtual zebra may look harmless to us, but for an elephant that has never seen one, it's a shocking sight. When the zebras first came into the park, the elephants were terrified of them. It was hysterical to watch because as soon as a zebra appeared on the horizon, the elephants would all just run away. And after a few weeks, they began to realize that zebras weren't quite so scary, but they were still a bit anxious in their presence. And instead of running away from them, they would chase them away. And now they've relaxed and they're quite happy to be in the vicinity of zebras. But it took them a couple of months to get used to zebras. In Addo, where elephants have been unchallenged for so long, curious calves often wander away from their mothers to explore. In a population where there are lions or you know carnivores like that, big carnivores, elephants under the age of one very rarely stray far from their mother. The other elephants are going to have a lot to learn when they introduce lions, and there probably will be mortalities, particularly of those little ones. Um, but they will learn. They'll learn pretty fast. This spectacular sunbird is one of more than 60 bird species already in the Addo Park. The expanded park will include six of Africa's seven major habitat types, or biomes, from the semi-desert Karoo to lush forests and spectacular coastal regions. So the variety of bird species in the park will increase greatly, attracting bird lovers from around the world. Addo is situated in a malaria-free area, unlike most game parks in Africa. So its wildlife attracts growing numbers of international visitors. The more adventurous can even leave their cars and get right up to the action on horseback. Dixon Witboy, who takes visitors on horse rides in the park, is one of many South Africans benefiting from Addo's tourism boom. We're going inside the game area where there's dangerous animals, elephants, buffaloes, rhinos. Your, your chances to see the game, it's much more than being in a vehicle because you're a bit higher than being in a vehicle. The tourists mean vital foreign currency for an economy still recovering from the ravages of South Africa's apartheid era. The park is bringing new prosperity to the Eastern Cape, the country's poorest province, and creating new jobs for its people. This is stimulating local interest in conservation. If you look back, they almost wiped us out, and today, this park, which attracts more visitors, than, believe it or not, than the Serengeti, um, is an uh, economic lifeblood to this area. Even inbreeding, the biggest threat to Addo's elephants is finally being addressed. So the other elephants, because they went down to a very small number and then they're inbred over the years, they've lost most of their genetic diversity. And because of that, we want to bring new blood in to, to reintroduce genetic diversity into the population. The new blood comes from several large bull elephants, like this one recently brought more than 2,000 kilometers from the Kruger National Park and released in Addo. As it proudly surveys its new home, 
the bull symbolizes a new beginning for the descendants of the tiny, terrorized herd of elephants that almost disappeared at the start of the 20th century. Its arrival and that of other bulls from the Kruger Park means Addo's elephants will continue to prosper into the 21st century. Finally, Avril and her companions can look forward to a secure future. Addo's elephants are back from the brink. <laughs>